Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Riverdale, Season 7, Episode 19. Great episode. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. It is the penultimate episode, and I think, in all honesty, this is such a beautiful episode. This season's had like a lot of really beautiful episodes. I mean, I, I, I don't want to take away from this season as a whole. Like, to me, one of the most beautiful episodes, and it, it, to me, it's just like the most beautiful ending, was the Archie the Musical episode where everyone hugged Kevin. I thought that was ridiculously beautiful, but this, it's just, especially how this episode was structured, because we got the conclusion of where these stories are in the 1950s. First and foremost, Jughead story, where this kind of has a context of what's going on in Riverdale High, because the principal gets kicked out because apparently there was an anonymous source about his connection to, uh, Everything that uh, specifically um, Penelope and Clifford were up to. I was almost wondering if it was home dude, the uh, the psychologist dude or whatever. I thought it was him, the way they faced off in the hallway. So I don't know if he did that on purpose because later on, he's like, oh, I'm going to go work in D.C. and basically be in a high position where we can basically talk about the power, the effect that comic books in particular have against children and stuff like that. Bastard kind of walked away getting the final laugh, but not really. It's it's kind of a so-so situation, but I'm like, I wonder did he sell out home dude just to kind of boost his own power, you know, and lead to the more favorable position he's aiming for by the time he leaves? Because he doesn't plan on becoming the uh, principal, you know, because he almost feels like it's almost like it's lost cause in a sense. So the school is without its principal until... Tony suggests someone. The moment she's like, well, you're going to pick someone. It's most likely going to be someone black. I, it should have crossed my mind it was going to be Weatherby. But when he showed up, I'm like, yeah, that's the obvious choice. It almost parallels the, sh the show's original run, to be fair. Because if I'm not, like, I know there was a new principal they got for a little bit after Weatherby. Well, they went through two principals, didn't they? Post-Weatherby. Maybe it was just one. Because I know there's the one that was killed by the, the Stonewall preps. But I don't remember. My memory's kind of shaky on that. Uh, but I want to say it might have... I feel like there was two, but maybe there just was one. But then Weatherby came back. I think he... Did he come back? I think he came back pre-time skip. I don't think it was just in the time skip that he came back. I think it was pre-time skip that he came back. But either way, it felt very poetic for him to be back. And he's talking about, yes, there's change coming. That basically you can kind of get with a program. You can kind of get the hell out. Which that ends up being a, a major powerful theme throughout this episode in that regard. And it's like, right, let's get to work. And it was this beautiful thing. Because they needed the uh, PTA to kind of be on their side. And the, the head of the PTA is Alice. She And I love that. It's like, right, the last time we went to Alice about something, we really couldn't count on her. But Betty's like, no, my mom's kind of, things are different. Because her mom isn't trying to necessarily, she's still upholding this pretense of what their family is. But she is a little bit more open. She's not the same person she has been. And I think that ends up being a beautiful thing we'll talk about more when we get to Betty's side of things. But let's, like I said, start off with Jughead's situation. Because of what the situation is at Pet Comics, their most recent, like, like, run it's like their comics are being rejected because of bs it's like right you're just making any stipulations you can just to keep us from running our comics and so jughead's boss is like all right we're going to put out because uh there was a uh, an adaptation of the comic which is a beautiful story like i i think that's something that came up in a previous episode i wanted to comment on but i completely forgot but obviously it's like well th this 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 uh group riverdale has their own connection to a comic so it's very poetic especially because it's about two people who are you know an interracial relationship between a black person and a white person and that's Jughead's relationship with Tabitha, so it's very like poetic in that regard, and it's, and and it comes through even more so in this episode as well. So it's all it all is very like reciprocal. It, it, I don't know if that's I'm probably not using that in the right um, context here, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. So, but uh, Jughead's boss is like, no, let's let this be. I'm kind of old, and maybe Pat Comics has had its time, but at the very least we should let this be our swan song. This is the most beautiful thing that we could go out swinging with. And so he even led uh, uh, Jughead do like, what was it, like the editorial for it or whatever. And it's like, yeah, like I don't know if all of you, a lot of people are going to be able to see this because some of these are probably going to end up being in a trash bin or a bonfire. But at the very least, if you're going to read this, let it change you. Kind of let that story wash over you because this is an important story. It is about opening up your worldview and seeing things. And I think... 
it has you we do see quite a few people reading the comic so i think it is despite and i hope and i hope on everything that that pet comic situation blows up in home dude's face like i said the therapist dude who's been a, just a nightmare this entire season i hope that blows up in his face and you know and it ends up kind of screwing him over and whatever he's trying to do and correlate between like he's got it i hope he ends up having an uphill battle which i think he will so I, I hope things don't kind of go the way he thinks and hopes that they will. I even love his boss leaving him a picture of the two of them together, and it's like, yeah, keep going, kid. Like this is this is our swan song, and this is our end, and obviously very poetic because it's like the comet was kind of like the swan song of last season, and that led to all of this, and this is the penultimate episode, and this is heading into this show swan song. So it's 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 all so meta and so beautiful and perfect. And what it's, you know, representing in that regard. And so. That actually ties into Veronica's story. Because Jughead kind of got her inspired to like, hey, why don't we adapt this into a movie? So they, uh, Veronica ended up buying the rights. We know that Clay wants to be a, like, director. So he's writing, like, the screenplay for this movie. And they're going to get Sidney Portier, uh for the role, which obviously very perfect um considering um and it's like right it's gonna be something that yeah they're gonna try and get you know in Cannes uh film festival type of situation in the next four or five years and it's just it's 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 so beautiful because this is a story that needs to be told and like obviously they were trying to shut it down comic wise and because it was already a book that was adapted into a comic now it's going to be adapted into a feature length film so and I, I think there probably would be no one more perfect for adapting that than um, Clay. He'd already been working on his own drafts of like making a version of the movie, so all the stars align. Let's switch to Kevin since we're talking about Clay really quickly. Kevin going to visit his dad, I thought like, okay, so his dad's going to have someone with him. And it's like, well, I wonder will Kevin have so much of an issue with that? It's like, yeah, that's going to be probably complicated. And then Uncle Frank walks out in the towel. It's like, oh yeah, my shower's broken. I was like, sh I was like shut the front door. I was like, this dad... Interesting, and at the same time, it almost feels poetic because, well, it's not like it's just because it's sad because Sheriff Keller had such an issue with Kevin being like, oh, I want him to be more manly, like I, oh, I don't want him to be gay. Like, let's not mince words. I didn't want him to be gay, and Frank was kind of hard on Kevin about that too. That's what he was also hard on Archie for being more like in tune with his emotions. And now it's like, okay, like the most like trying to be manly men. It turns out, you know. Because they're pushing this this stereotype of what a man should be. When it's like, there are no like clear guidelines of what that's supposed to be. It's such a, it varies from person to person. What a man should be, what a woman should be. It's so fluid and, you know, it comes down to the individual to be who they are. But it's like, it, I think it, it ties back into that thing of, oh, the most homophobic, homophobic people are, I don't, I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but there's a good chance that that homophobia stems from themselves being in the closet and them having some internal homophobia and struggling with their own sexuality and projecting and putting that on Kevin when they, them, I mean, cause part of me wonders, like, I was like, I wonder is that indicating, I was like, does that mean Kevin, that uh, Sheriff Keller, like, maybe he's always been bi, but I don't think we've ever seen him have, um, male partner because i i want to say like outside of his marriage the only other person we saw him with was josie's mom right didn't that end pre-time skip i think that was something that kind of dissolved during the time skip i, I don't think we saw that really i think that relationship was in a good place and then it just kind of like next thing you know they're not together so, and I, like i said i think that was post time skip so I don't know. I just, I just think that's interesting. Like, I was, I wonder is that has that character always been by and it just never came up in the show or not, or maybe it's just supposed to be this time he's getting divorced. Frank's kind of out of the house. He's not. I mean, he still pops in for di Sunday dinners with the fam, but he's kind of been ostracized a little bit from his family, and I guess. Uh, Sheriff Keller's kind of in the same boat, but you could see, look, see the look on Kevin's face. Like he's not a hundred percent sure, but he's also being like, "Wait, is this what I think it is?" Which, if it is, once again, it's a hundred percent hypocrisy. The BS that they put him through, trying to be like, "Oh, he needs to be more manly. He needs to 
be around more men, show they can show him, to, you know, he can't really, be, you know, like they had so much, it's, and because, especially because Kevin internalized that, like even a, a, a couple of episodes back asking his mom, are you getting a divorce because of me? But his mom is like, no, we love you for you. So, and his dad has, I mean, like I said, that's kind of the sad thing too. Like his dad, you know, because Kevin was already out by the time the show started, but I don't remember Sheriff Keller ever having any issues with it. I thought his dad was always very respectful and receptive. Once again, it is a different time period, so that has to be considered, but still, I think his dad had always been okay with who he was. And like I said, I think it just in this situation, it's like his own sexuality. It, just, it was like eternalized homophobia, and he just kind of projected a lot of that on Kevin, because maybe he himself was having issues with his wife, but not really knowing what it was, and and, and maybe that's why he wanted to push even more for Kevin to be okay, because maybe there were issues already between Sheriff Keller and his wife and, you know, the relationship and everything. So that was just, I, that took me by surprise. I was, like I said, the moment he opened the door, I was like, oh, he's got someone with him. For one, didn't expect it to be a dude, let alone didn't expect it to be Frank. So that was quite the surprise. Uh, we have the Blossoms picking up after Penelope and um, Clifford being removed from the situations. So Nana Rose and Julian and uh, Cheryl, which is very poetic considering, well, the last time we left off with the Blossoms, they were the only ones still kind of around in the aftermath of everything. Even Julian, even though he was a doll, but you get, you get the whole point. So it feels very poetic for them to be there and continuing the Blossom legacy. And Cheryl sealing back her vixens from um, Evelyn, which I even love at the assembly. Everyone's clapping about Weatherby, and she's kind of like, oh, fine, whatever, and she kind of claps. But yeah, uh, I love that uh, Cheryl challenged her to a uh, dance-off and then, like, s slaughtered it. And it's kind of like, cool, your turn. And Evelyn was just so frustrated. She just screams and walks off. So I guess, like, there's no spot on the team because, like, now that you've been dethroned, yeah, like, I'm not going to have, like, a serpent like you behind me, which obviously, once again, poetic considering, like, you know, an ironic considering Cheryl was Serpent Queen at one point in time. So it's very poetic for me to uh, reference serpents and stuff. But either way, and now Cheryl's... Open, she's like, yeah, I'm gonna be out in the light. The fact is, me and uh, Tony are in a relationship. You got a problem with it? You can basically go in a garbage can with like Evelyn. But then there's also two members of her squad are like, no, we want to be in the light too. So not only did she get her vixens back, which the vixens have always been super important to. I think for her, it's, it's it's kind of like her family outside of her family. It was always part of her escapism from the blossoms. So that was really nice. Um, we have Archie. Weatherby ended up getting their original uh, teacher back, the one that got fired for being a communist. She was finally brought back, so uh, it's kind of sad Miss Grundy's not going to be around. But obviously, they're both influential in making Archie into the poet that he is and the journey he wants to go on because he wants to this summer go on, like, you know, kind of turn into a vagabond a little bit, travel around the world, and get to, you know, uh, enhance his poetry um, with that. And his teacher kind of signed off on it. Um, and I thought I thought that was kind of niche because she's like, yeah, those experiences will help you grow. It is something you should be doing, especially at such a young age. Um, Reggie's got the whole situation with the basketball camp thing, but the problem is it coincides with um, this particular kind of like farming situation back home, where the farming that his family does at this time frame is what's essential to like pay off like they're farming for the rest of the year. So it is very crucial. So he, he's obviously going to choose working at home on the farm versus basketball, despite his dreams of wanting to go to college because he wanted to use all that to help out his family regardless. But Archie's like, no, like I can use this as inspiration. Plus I get to break bread with your mom and your dad. Like this could all be an adventure for me to go on. But also this is your opportunity. I'm not going to let you miss it, bro. And it's like, they hug it out and they're like, love you, Archie. I mean, I love you, Reggie. I love you too, Archie. Like, and I, I brought it up time and time again. I love, because they've always been like rivals, but they've had like a real deep brother. Like I had brought it up. Like it's funny enough that Archie and Jughead's relationship is kind of transferred over to Archie and Reggie. Like I said, a lot of the relationship dynamics have changed, not just the friendships, but even the partnerships and in, in, in a lot of, and in, in, in some capacities. So I thought that was really interesting. And I thought that was like really, really beautiful. You have Betty showing off her to her mom her book that she wrote. Because we, we catch up a little bit, obviously post everything that came out last episode about Ethel being uh, 
Betty and uh, Betty and Polly's half sister, but also like right. They're still going to keep up with the pretense of, hey, we're a family, but Hal's going to be living in a basement. And it's like, well, why don't you divorce him now, Mom? It's like, well, because nothing's in my name, especially in this time frame. I've been married to him so long. Everything's in his name. I don't even own the station. He owns the house. I wouldn't even be able to open a bank account on my own, like, given everything that's kind of going on. So for her, it's like it's too much of a hassle. She stayed for the sake of protecting her family and her children. But now it's like she's kind of in too deep and she's like, well, just kind of muster through it. But it's like, no, your happiness matters, too. And so when... Uh, Betty ends up writing her book. Well, when her, she gets a copy of her book, she wants her mom to read it, which her mom has a reluctancy, like, oh, oh, good on you, sweetie, for writing a book. And she does read it. And I, I was right, though. I was like, I, I figured their coming together might happen on, like, Polly's wedding. I didn't know if we'd get that in the show. We still might in the series finale, but for her to, like, break down like that where it's just like that book isn't just about learning about Betty. It's about all the other young women who wrote into Betty. And um, their stories, their perspectives, their situations, it made Alice kind of like, you know, turn like it kind of made her put up a mirror to kind of look at herself. And it's like for her, it's like all I because like, she even said, like, what would I do if I divorced your dad? Because eventually you'd go off to college and I'd be all alone. She's like, I have not been all alone uh, ever because up until I was living with my parents, I married your dad after the fact. So like I've I've never been alone. And. So she kind of didn't really feel like she had anything else going on in her life because it's like, oh, when I was younger, yeah, I wanted to be a flight attendant. But it's like that's that was a young girl. I was a you know, I was a dreamer. That's all it was. A pipe dream, a young girl's dream. But it's like, no, it's never like too late to dream that it's like her life is still hers to do what she wants to with. Like, it's OK to still dream, you know. And so let's, it's going to be interesting to see whether Alice makes something of that or not. Will she actually go out? Like, I mean, I'm sure by the end of this, her and Hal will probably get divorced. And I don't know what that's going to be for Betty, especially considering everything she learns later on, what that means with her relationship with her dad. I'm sure she can, sadly, she'll have to compartmentalize some stuff. But what that means, like, because at least, like, her dad's not, like, her dad's a cheater, but he's not, like, the scumbag, terrible human being that he was in the original timeline. So it's like... You know, it's it's weird to say, but it's like I'd rather I'm sure she'd take rather take a cheating howl than the um, serial killer howl that he was, especially considering like that wasn't just him that kind of ran in their family. So I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how. But I think I, I think Alice will kind of go off and have her dream and kind of live for herself, especially. At, and maybe we'll kind of time skip a little bit and get to see like. This is Betty off on her own out of college, and Alice gets to kind of like, right, I'm going to go do my thing. Because she doesn't, she wouldn't have to wait that long because, once again, they are juniors. So it would be a pretty quick turnaround in that capacity of just like, oh, yeah, like uh, maybe put it off a year, wait for her to graduate, and then get prepared for college, and then kind of go off and live her dreams for, and live her own life and find her own happiness, you know? And then we got the very beautiful surprise. The moment Tabitha showed up, and I was like, "That's not this time frame, Tabitha. It's a, it's Guardian of uh, Riverdale, Tabitha, or Angel Tabitha, as they call her." I was like, "I was like, so they are bringing this full circle." I was like, "Poetic." I was like, "Of course." I was like, "Because once again, they have not touched on this storyline since the first episode of the season." And I'm like, "Are we just no? Are we really just going to leave it as is?" But it's like, no. It kind of pulled a bit of a Loki. Not only did she let, like, uh, Jughead remember everything, it's like, cool. Showed him basically a recap of the entire show, which I thought was beautiful. Very meta and very poetic. But then it's like, cool, now that you know everything, how I fixed everything is, instead of, like, trying to fix and unweave every timeline, like I said, she pulled a Loki, and it's one sacred timeline now, so, but the problem is, because the timelines are fixed now, she can never return them to 19, uh, 2023, it's like, that's done, like, you, you'd have to live out the rest of your lives here, but... I can give you your memories back of the lives you had. So the question is, do you, if I can make that happen, but the question then becomes, does everyone want to remember? So Jughead brought this to everyone. Obviously he brought it up in the first episode of the season. Everyone thought he was crazy, but this time, like, you know, uh, Archie drew the short stick and ended up being the one who ends up remembering. Once again, poetic in so many regards. It makes sense why um, Tabitha would, May Jughead remember? Well, first and foremost, 
you know, the Rivervale situation of it all is very poetic in that capacity, but it's also like, right, he was the last one to remember. He was, in fact, the only one who remembered of the group. So it felt very poetic for him to get his memories back first and also for Archie to be the one who remembers. And and that's the thing of like the good, as he puts it later on, the good, the bad. And he looks at Archie, the bear. I was like, oh, right, the bear. Because like I, I find that so interesting, too, because like, in retrospect, people made theory videos after the, that, the week of that episode, Ari, because then people were like, yo, did the show just kill off Archie? And it's like, no, he was fine the next episode. A lot of people were certain he was super dead. I was like, did they just kill off their lead character? It's like, no. Nah. It, it, that experience changed him drastically, and it's like, so it's very poetic. Um, it's also poetic, too, considering there is a show literally just called The Bear, so it's also the, that, that was also kind of floating through my mind. But yeah, one by one, and in some cases pairs, everyone kind of like got the video. I love that Kevin initially didn't want to go because he found out about Clay not being a part of it. It's like, yeah, because the person he was with last was Moose. Um, then there's also, um, who else didn't want to go? Oh yeah, Julian, who found out he was just a doll in a previous life. It's like, yeah, I wouldn't be too happy and keen on that either. But this also plays into the, once again, my big number one question, I'm like, what are the what are the couples going to look like at the end of this, considering what the couples were before all this went down? And that ends up coming up because it's like, wow, Betty and Archie were a thing at one point in time. But even Betty, when she's talking to Jughead, it's like, you and me were a thing. He's like, yeah, we were until we weren't, especially because that's kind of awkward because like, Betty and Veronica fought over Archie and, you know, the back and forth in that that triangle in the previous timeline, but now it's not really as much of a thing in this timeline, but it kind of was. But now, like, Veronica and Jughead are k dating, even though, like, that never really happened previously. They did kiss, like, once or twice when Archie and um, Betty had kissed at one point in time. So it's just, it's so interesting and complicated. But I'd probably, well, I was about to say, Betty has a rough end of a deal. It's like, no, so does uh, Veronica, because it's like, oh, I remember killing my husband, Chad, and my dad. Um, Betty's like, cool, my dad's a serial killer. My sister died, but then, not died, she was murdered, came back to life. I My family's been riddled with darkness. So it's like, oh, cool, 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 cool. That's amazing. So it's like, so much to kind of learn from that. I mean, like, even, like, use the whole fangs and, um, because obviously Cheryl was dating, oh, God, I'm blanking on her name. Um, I'm blanking on her name from last season. All this, I feel so bad I'm blanking on, Heather! Oh, my God, I would have felt so terrible if I'd forgotten, but her and Heather, whereas, uh, Tony and fangs were a thing, but obviously a Tim and Midge in this one and she's pregnant with his child, so it's like, the one that got me to is like, well, Dilton's there. I was like, that's going to be uber depressing because, once again, Dilton super got murdered in season three with the whole Gargoyle King thing. So I was like, that's interesting. And now that everyone remembers their past, it's like, what are you going to do about him? Veronica suggests like, oh, can we just keep the good memories? Which for Tabitha's like, no, I can do that. I mean, considering everything you guys have been through it feels right that I do that. Like, it's the least I can do for you guys, you know? Because it's like, yeah, all the darkness, the superpowers. I love how they kind of almost like, jokingly, almost like, yeah, that was weird that we got superpowers. I like, I love they kind of toss that in there like that. Like, yeah, that whole, ugh, superpower thing? Oh, I can't believe, I can't believe we did that. I can't believe that happened to us. It's so weird to think like, yeah, that the entire last season was about superpowers. No one could have told me they saw that happening in Riverdale. I know that was an issue for some people, like some person, I'm, someone else I know. Like, I'll go ahead and say, Roxy Stryer had talked about that previously, where she was just like, that was just kind of so out there for her. I loved it, but I, I know like she had it, she was just like, because once again, as wild as Riverdale is, at least it had always been grounded to some extent. That's when they were like, Oh, let's go balls to the walls. Let's go balls deep in the weir for Riverdale. So, I mean, that also led to, like, our um, crossover with Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, so I'll always be happy about that, you know? So, and being able to kind of get everyone together watching it, even during the awkward parts where it's like, a, oh, uh, Reggie and Veronica, even though there's a Veronica and Jughead situation now, or Jughead and Tabitha, and just the complicatedness that has been the relationships. Once again, let's kind of skirt over the fact that Dilton died and everything. But even Kevin watched, Clay watched, and even... Um, uh, 
Julian watched and had been able to kind of look at back at the show. It's so interesting and very poetic. Like though, even those who weren't involved, like a Clay or a Julian, for them to kind of look back and look at all the beautiful memories that had kind of been associated, kind of have all that. You know, that's got to be interesting and wild. Um, the the good, the bad, just, you know, even the, even though it's saying the the bear, but it's like yeah, the ugliness of just everything that they've been through. Because even Archie had touched on, I forgot to talk about it, where it's like for him, it's like yeah, like being able to see this all again. It's like I got my dad back, but then I lost him again. But he's like, I never thought I'd get to see my dad again. So for him, keeping these memories are super important. And so for them, it's just like yeah, they made the choice to just keep the good memories. But for this Tabitha, she can't stay here because it's like right. Kind of got a, I think it's kind of like protecting a space time continuum. What kind of result, what, what exists for her beyond all of this? Who knows? Because like, there's only one timeline now, I guess maybe just kind of keeping an eye over it, maybe because it's like, um, there is already a Tabitha here who becomes a civil rights activist who lives her life and dedicates herself to that fight. But, um, They've all gotten their lives bad. Like, all the bad that they've been through, they kind of get, like, a fresh start of, like, here's the good that we're able to build for ourselves in this time frame and the better future that's going to be brought about because of that. But we also get memories of where we came from. So they're all kind of whole in so many capacities in so many ways. And sadly, Jughead has to say goodbye to Tabitha. It's like, what did our lives that we had together mean? It's like, no. Even that somewhere out there, that space-time bubble we were in where we got to live our entire lives together... That still exists, and that happened, and it did matter. But, you know, this is kind of has to be their goodbye, you know? I even love the whole, like, oh, he's like, I'm sad you had to die to do that. She's like, no, but I didn't die because that didn't happen. And he's like, oh, yeah, the space kind con- like, uh, the paradox conundrum or, or something like that, so. And it's it's very poetic that Jughead is like, I'm not, I, unlike my compatriots, I chose to remember the bad the dark sides of Riverdale too because it's as kind of its historian it feels poetic for me to be the one you know it started with Jughead and almost feels very befitting for it to kind of end with Jughead in that regard but he's not the only one who else would keep all their memories I was like it's not gonna be Archie is it's like no Betty which I think out of any character is so poetic considering her struggle with her light and her darkness has been the most prominent of any. Like, yes, Archie's had his, but obviously Betty's dark, tr- dark struggle with her darkness has always run super deep in the show. And so for her, it, it is that thing of, once again, your your experiences are what made you, what make, make you who you are, the good and the bad, the light and the darkness, that equilibrium. And I think knowing both sides of herself, remembering both sides of herself kind of will help fully form her even more and just on this path that she's going to go down. And like I said, now knowing like, cool, your dad's a cheater in the timeline, but he was also like a serial killer. Also now knowing like, yeah, remembering your brother, Charles, your half brother, Charles, the serial killer. Wasn't he a serial killer? Or was he just a murderer? I'm pretty sure he was a serial killer, right? Whatever the case may be, Charles, you know, remembering that as well. So, but I mean, at least you have the positive side of, hey, I, I have, I, Polly's alive and she's not, she wasn't murdered. Um, so that's good. And she's getting married. And you also have a half sister in this timeline instead of Charles. And so that's going to be a little, a little complicated. Once again, how everyone moves past the whole life. Yeah, we all now know we had different relationships with others, but it's like we are. It's that Jughead had to balance that in episode one, but now everyone does. It's also the thing of like, it feels poetic that it's like the core cast of characters remember, except not the adults. So that's going to be interesting how they juggle that going forward. But it was so beautiful that obviously as Jughead's typing up like the final chapter for this show and saying like it's very apt that the final chapter would be called Goodbye Riverdale, which is the name of the series finale. So it's like I was getting choked up. This this episode I was on the board I was on the like cusp of tears. Like I I felt like the tears kinda of welling up in my eyes. I, I had this tightness in my chest and it's just like I'm, I'm never afraid to admit when a show like makes me feel something. I I guarantee you the series finale is probably gonna make me cry. It's probably gonna make me cry and I'm just like it it just feels unreal for it to be the end and it's like we're right there. Next episode is an end. It didn't play out. It it played. It's going to play out kind of what I thought because I it, I brought it up in a review how I thought the series was going to end. In fact, it's actually a short you can find on the channel. But 
it's not really, I, I wasn't expecting them to stay present day. I thought some of this stuff would carry over with them back in present day. I didn't realize that they would stay in the 50s. And it's like, what does that mean? Like, will we almost kind of get this oh, like oh, like almost rebootish situation where it's like, we'll see them all grow old, eventually have kids of their own. And like, maybe their grandkids end up being kind of the, uh, we get to see like young versions of the characters because it's actually like they're each of their grandchildren and they're going to be here in Riverdale. I mean, also, especially the way they set it up, especially last episode where Jill gets it like, oh, everyone kind of goes their separate ways. With everything that everyone's kind of set up, it's probably going to be post-graduation because everyone went their separate ways, kind of graduation-wise. Like I said, some people probably stick around, some people won't, and it's going to be interesting to see who will. I could see Jughead and Veronica not sticking around. I could see Betty and Archie, maybe... I, I don't I don't know. That's kind of hard to see tell which way that's going to go. Um, I'd assume they'd become like an official because they haven't officially become a couple, but now they remember everything. So it's going to be real interesting to see if like I'd, I'd assume they'd become a couple too. It's just kind of like yeah, after everything we've been through. So that's going to be so. Oh, well, because yeah, because at least this summer, I, I get. I wonder we probably won't get their senior year, will we? Just because it's like right, summer vacations coming up and stuff. And Archie made that promise to Reggie, so I could definitely see them kind of time skipping. Maybe at the very, very end of it, we flash forward, get a little bit of a montage of their lives, or we could just kind of like. I, I, I'm so curious to see because, like, like I said, the goodbye Riverdale is the meta thing of that because the show's ending. But it could also be like maybe it's not even just some. Maybe every one of the main characters leaves Riverdale, and maybe they'll come back in some capacity, like in some time skip thing later on, coming back, just like the time skip in season five uh, of them coming back. You know, after seven years. So, and I think that would be more beautiful because. It was kind of sadder when they were supposed to reunite because they didn't. They were supposed to come back like every year. Jughead showed up one like the first three, maybe two or three years, or maybe he, I think he only showed up for the first year anniversary, but no one else did. And they wouldn't see each other in Gill until like that seven year, that, into a total of seven years. So I'm so curious to see exactly what happens in the series finale, how this show comes to an end, because this is a beautiful setup. You know, once again, I always think it's so interesting when the finale series finales end up being more rather than epilogue being part of the episode, that the entire episode feels more like an epilogue than it does just like a final chapter. That's what I kind of feel. But it, it'll probably really I mean, it, it's still probably gonna be like, oh, this is the final chapter. But like the end of the episode is more like the epilogue. But sometimes when series finales are structured or certain way, they feel more epilogue ish. Like I'd say Supernatural's series finale felt more like an epilogue than it did its series finale. I know not everyone like jive at the series finale of Supernatural. I really liked it, but that's a that's a whole other uh, conversation. But either way, I am very, very excited and also a little sad to find out how Riverdale comes to an end. But really, that's all I want to talk about. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good Bye.